G'day everyone. Oh well, welcome to 5 Minute Fridays. Well, this is the first of 5 Minute Fridays. Uh, it will be a series, probably not every Friday, but uh, going forward I, I plan to do <clears throat> continue this uh, afternoon chat with, you, with, uh, with my audience and uh, different themes each time. So today, 5 Minute Friday is all about PV Array standards, uh, this, the joint standard with Australia and New Zealand, ASNZS 5033. Now I'm doing this uh, yesterday and today really focusing very much on uh, my Kiwi uh, fellow installers over there. Um, I'm based in Australia these days but I, I grew up in New Zealand and I know you're doing it tough with uh, a, a sudden lockdown. I um, hope that that doesn't last as long as the one here in Melbourne is at the moment. Uh, we've got six weeks of lockdown. But also to all my uh, Melbourne colleagues uh, who are also in lockdown here in Melbourne. So if you're stuck at home and uh, you're a bit bored you might as well learn something or even just uh, have some fun. I invite everyone to use the comments uh, to, as a place to ask questions. So if you type them in there, I can see them. I can bring them on screen and I can answer them. So um, just let you know that I will bring them on screen so people can see the comments. So um, make sure you check your spelling before you press post. <laughs> so that's always a good one. Yeah, so uh, 5033, its history is it's, uh, it was actually the first uh, PV standard uh, that to be adopted for uh, by the IEC and uh, they modified it of course to make it an IEC standard. So Australia and New Zealand actually led the world with our um, photovoltaic standards and they've had a few updates. So we had the earlier version in 2005 I think, 2012, 2014, then amendments 1 and 2 and right now we're working on a update to 2000, uh, well, which will probably go to public draft uh, early next year. So it's a pretty live standard and uh, it keeps getting better. So I'm going to focus on the 2014 edition which is the current version uh, in Australia and it, it is the one that's used in New Zealand even though for the strange reasons of New Zealand electricity regulations the 2012 one is listed. Um, most of the changes in the 2014 are just clarifications uh, and to uh, you know, no, major, no major changes. So it's good to, to understand the differences. I'll also talk a bit about Amendments 1 and 2 uh, very briefly, which are really for New Zealand installers are just best practice advice, um, though they're uh, available here, and they allow us to use integrated DC isolators and inverters, which is a big plus. Uh, and also um, there's a lot more control over uh, certification of switchgear in those two amendments. So I'm going to bring up a, uh, a slide deck now. Let's just bring that up. Go and bring my little. Okay, so um, got the wrong camera there. There we go. So this is a, a, a picture that I really love. Um, it, it just shows you uh, how big systems have got uh, going forward. Uh, we're seeing commercial solar really, really taking off uh, in. Uh, in Australia and also in New Zealand. The reason for it is just the cost of solar has got so low that it's not a matter of uh, do you believe in renewables being the future of the world? Um, uh, are you excited by renewables? Uh, do you just want to you know, have something green and clean on the roof of your building? It doesn't have to be any of that, it's just cheaper electricity. And commercial customers often are the best um, match for, for solar because they actually use energy when the sun shines. And uh, that makes them a really an excellent choice for, for solar. So um, I'm just trying to bring my little floating picture up here. Let's see if I can bring it up. Whoops, where are we? That's the wrong one. Try that one. There we go. Um, yeah, so just so you can see me talking while I'm sitting there. There we go. Got my brick wall behind me. <laughs> So yeah, uh, I love this picture because uh, the installer feels the enthusiasm. He's uh, pumping high five after having finished the job. Anyway, let's look at the standard. One of the major changes from the 2012 edition, like I said, it's really mostly a, an update uh, to what was there previously. And uh, the 2012 edition was a, a significant change from the earlier version, but the 2014 is uh, just a bit more refinement, things like scope of the standard, um, introducing DC conditioning units. Now, if you haven't heard of these ter this term before, uh, people sometimes refer to them as optimizers. They're something that sits between the panel and the string. Great, great. 
Okay, so <laughs> thanks all those out there in WhatsApp land letting me know that I bug it up and uh, I had to relaunch that. You wouldn't believe it, I was trying to resize the window and I clicked by accident finish live stream. Uh, <sighs> mistakes for beginners. All right, but uh, I'm going to edit this later on, so I'll just carry on where I left off and that way you won't have to listen to me do another whole intro. So let me bring that up. There we go. Okay, so where were we? We're back on the, the um, scope of 5033 and what are the major changes uh, to it from the previous edition. So requirements for labelling of, of cables and cable protection, uh, labelling of conduits and type of conduits, uh, connector requirements, new signs and, and uh, other commissioning requirements. So let's just jump into it. DC... Conditioning units. Wow. Now, um, these are, yes, some people love all them, hate them. They're more little boxes on the roof, uh, but they provide definite advantages when it comes to things like uh, safety, performance, monitoring. But they had a problem in the previous version of 5033, the 2012 edition. They weren't really recognised, and that meant that um, we were seeing... Uh, these perfectly good systems uh, being disadvantaged by the fact that the previous standard required you to put a DC isolator on every piece of power conditioning equipment, which would include uh, DCUs or optimizers. And that just wouldn't be practical. Imagine putting a DC isolator under every panel on every optimizer. So we clarified that in the 2014 edition, said, no, 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 no not required. Um, they're a, a special purpose of equipment. We still need isolation on the array, uh, but not on every single DCU. So that was, a, that was a big plus. We did limit the definition to 350 watts. And back in 2014, that seemed like plenty. Um, but what do you know, panels have got bigger and bigger and bigger. So back then, panels were around the 150 to 180 watt mark. Now they're, um, you know, 300 plus, 400 plus. Jesus, there's 500 pan watt panels out there now. Uh, so uh, that's one of the things that's being revised um, is the definition of a DCU and what the maximum power of it is without having to have individual isolation on each one. So here's the summary of those changes uh, to DCU re requirements in the 2014 edition. Uh, it includes uh, four major things, that the cable length um, to the DCU can't be more than one and a half metres. You can't extend the fly leads of the panels, except um, you can put adapters. And the reason for that is you're not, you must have like-for-like -like connectors on all your panels and uh, anything they connect to, such as DCUs. And uh, there isn't a standard for D DC connectors. Uh, there are lots of different brands. Many of them kind of work together. You sort of plug them in and you think they're the same thing, but they're not manufactured to be pushed together. And therefore, um, we require that all plugs and sockets are the same brand, same type, both sides of the connection. But so you are allowed to use adapter cables to overcome that where your DCU, your optimizer, has brand X plugs and sockets on it and your inverter has brand Y, and you can get a short adapter. As I mentioned, no more than 350 watts at standard test conditions, PV power, uh, and the panels must be extra low voltage. You can have multiple DCUs in one package. Uh, these are not very common, but there's a few out there, but you do need to have uh, a, an input for each DCU, and maximum 350 watts again. The PCE DC isolator requirements, um, if the DC conditioning system unit has a fail-safe uh, so that the open circuit voltage of the array is that of the inverter's maximum input. Now, that's kind of complicated the way I've said it. Basically, uh, you might think putting 20 panels in a string is going to get well over 600 volts, which is the upper limit for residential systems in Australia and New Zealand currently. But when you put DCUs on every panel, they control the voltage. And uh, in, you know, many of them will start at you know, one volt uh, until the inverter tells them to turn on and tells them what voltage the string should be. So it's actually the inverter that controls the string voltage. And therefore, if the inverter's got a maximum input voltage of, say, 600 volts, it doesn't actually matter that you've got 20 panels out there in a string, uh, which notionally, if you just took the VOC of each panel, would be greater than 600 volts, but the DCUs control it. So that's one of the reasons um, that you can uh, get away with this uh, by using um, DCUs. 
Now, I just saw a text message uh, that someone that we went offline. I'm just going to send a link to that person so they know that we're back on. Um, okay, that's good. Yep. So, <laughs> getting getting a few messages coming in about the the dropout. So, very sorry about that, uh, people. And um, I'm just going to. Uh, share the link with those people who just texted me. There we go. Good. And there's a picture of the DCUs and explaining how they work. So each one interfaces between the PVRA and the string, the uh, string of panels that are connected together in series, and therefore they are um, controlling the string voltage collectively. In fact, there are different um, systems for this. Uh, sometimes the inverter, in this case it, we use the generic term PCE, power conditioning equipment, because it may be other than an inverter, but generally it is. Uh, it's telling each of those DCUs what their current and voltage should be uh, to get the, the target string voltage that the inverter wants. So that's how they work. This is actually a picture of mine, um, well it's actually you know, from Google, but it's a picture of a system I put in back in 2009 I think. Uh, it was the first time I ever used DCUs and uh, these, these were, um, uh, it's a solar edge system and this is a two story house. The, I think there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different uh, orientations and inclinations on this roof. So the panels are scattered like, like playing cards across the building but they're actually all in one string. So it's pretty amazing uh, that you can do this. But the, the benefit is that the customer actually gets to have a reasonable sized system on a very difficult roof for solar. Uh, I must admit, I was kind of tried to talk the customer out of it, saying, look, your roof is really not suitable. And they put it to me, that's not my problem, that's your problem, Glenn. Come up with a way to put solar on my house. So we did, we used optimizers. So, in the standard, it says that all modules in a string must face the same direction, plus or minus five degrees of inclination and azimuth, that's compass bearing, unless they have individual maximum power point tracking devices. And that's what a DCU is. It operates each panel independently of every other panel. So that's, that's the solution to that problem. Uh, microinverters. Now, uh, generically, both optimizers, DCUs, uh, and microinverters are known as Module Level Power Electronics, or MLPE. Uh, I won't use that acronym much, but I'll just talk about microinverters and optimizers. Microinverters are a similar function to a um, optimizer, but they convert from DC to AC. So you've actually got a AC network up onto your roof, and every panel, the highest DC voltage is one panel because there's no strings of panels connected together in series or DC strings. The advantages of microinverters therefore is safety. You've only got an AC network on the, on the roof so that your normal overcurrent protection systems uh, in the home will protect that circuit. Um, you don't have the risk of arcing that you can get with DC at higher voltages. Uh, they give you the same benefit of optimization at a module level uh, and monitoring. So both uh, microinverters uh, and DCUs or optimizers generally will give you a monitoring solution as well that allows you to see uh, the performance of every panel. Same uh, requirements as a optimizer, maximum length of cable one and a half meters, uh, no ex extension on cables. You can use DC adapters uh, to, to adapt between different plugs and socket types. If you've got multiple optimizers in a single package, each needs its own MPVT, maximum power point tracker, uh, and each input must be less than 350 watts uh, DC uh, at standard test conditions. The uh, multiple input micros are pretty rare these days, um, but as long as they're ELV on the input uh, and 350 watts per input, then they're fine as well. And I think if I go back a slide, there is actually a picture in the top uh, left of your screen um, of a microinverter with multiple inputs, sorry, multiple um, panels connected to it. But if you look carefully, there's actually only one input. And so it's using Y connectors. Now that would not be compliant. You can't use Y connectors. You actually have to have individual MPPTs for each panel. 
PV frame earthing, um, equal potential bonding or equi potential bonding, I should say, is a special definition of earthing. It's not a protective earth. Uh, it's not a shield earth. It's kind of a, a, a hybrid of several things. And the purpose of it is mostly about detecting if there is a fault between the DC side of a PV array and earth and therefore um, having a reference point to earth on the conductive parts of the module allow the inverter to see that fault, uh, raise an alarm and turn off. So it's for sensing faults as opposed to providing a fault path for current. The minimum cable size, um, I'm a little bit in the way with my picture there, let's move it up, is four millimetres square. Um, that's really about mechanical robustness. Uh, even though there's virtually no current flowing through uh, this, even in a fault condition, it's be pretty light. Uh, it's there just so it doesn't get broken, really. But there is some circumstances where you would have to increase the size of that, such as if it's part of a lightning protection system. The lightning protection standard says minimum of 16 millimetres square. Uh, or if the fault current could be um, greater than 4 millimetres um, square cable could carry. I bring myself down again. Um, so all PV, uh, all LV PV arrays require bonding uh, of the module frames and mounting system. Now, what I mean by low voltage PV arrays is systems over 120 volts DC need to have the conductive parts of the modules and frames and mounting systems bonded to earth. Uh, this is usually done using what is called bonding washers and an earth lug, but there are other means to do it. The, the, the purpose of this is to provide a common path to earth on all of the conductive parts. And the requirement also is that if you remove any one panel, you don't compromise the earthing system. So you can't just daisy chain um, panels together. You need to actually have effectively either an earth bar using the, the module uh, mounting system uh, or a continuous earth uh, that each module connects to. And uh, we've got a question here. Let's have a look at it. Okay, so thanks, Dave. Um, does the earthing cable need to be tinned? Now, there's a requirement in the standard that um, there is a definition for the PV array cable. The PV array cable has to meet a certain um, solar standard. It's often just referred to as solar DC cable, but that doesn't apply to the earth conductor. So no, you don't actually have to use a tinned um, earth conductor, uh, but you do still need to mechanically protect that and protect it from UV. So it's quite common just to use four millimeter um, uh, you know, standard earth conductor wire uh, in, in parallel with the DC cables in the same conduit. And uh, that's, that's a very convenient way of doing it. Thanks for, that, thanks for that one, Dave. For microinverters, they actually have AC coming up to them. So as AS3000, ASNZ S3000 would require, they actually need to have um, a, uh, uh, an earth bond to the conductive parts of the module, uh, sorry, of the uh, microinverter. And since you've already got an earth coming up to the microinverter, uh, it's practical to use that as your bonding terminal for your array as well. And you'll find that uh, many of the manufacturers of microinverters, though there's not many left really these days, um, will provide you with that earthing terminal. Though there are some which, are non, which aren't made of uh, metal parts and therefore they're double insulated. And so you'd still need to, to bring an earthing conductor up to the array in that case. Segregation. Uh, now segregation is one of those topics that's been covered in, in uh, ASNZS3000, but it was covered really considering DC as a telecommunication um, signal, not as DC as a power um, transmission system. And in ASNZS3000, it refers to segregation on voltage level, that means LV or ELV, and telecommunication cables. However, a 600 volt DC cable uh, is the same voltage level as a 230 volt AC cable, and just reading AS NZS3000, you would think you don't need to segregate them because they're both the same voltage level and neither is a tele telecommunication service. But we amended um, AS NZS5033 to include uh, DC cables as a special category. And so you are required to segregate AC and DC circuits within enclosures to IP4X, that's a one millimeter probe. 
and 50 millimetres of separation outside of enclosures. Otherwise, um, ASNZS 3000's segregation requirements apply. Okay. Um, oh, I just saw a news blast come through from New Zealand. Uh, <laughs> the government announced uh, announcement on lockdown. So let me know in the comments, uh, uh, New Zealand uh, viewers, what, what the latest on the lockdown is. So segregation requirements there, I've covered those off, I think, in my spiel there. Um, if a common mounting rail then must be non-conductive, now that means with inside an enclosure, I'm talking about the DIN rail inside an enclosure. If you do have a DIN rail that spans two sides of an enclosure, the DC side and the AC side, it's either split or non-conductive. Where you've got um, in the same enclosure AC and DC circuits, they need to be differentiated by colour, so you can't have a positive red and an active red, uh, and outside enclosures 50 mils of separation. PV cables inside uh, buildings. <laughs> yes, uh, someone said. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Chris. Um, just pointing out time to go surfing. So, Chris, I presume you're in New Zealand then. Um, yeah, that's right. So, <laughs> lockdowns can sometimes give you a bit more free time, uh, though not much socialising in, 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 as part of it. So, cables with inside buildings. Uh, require mechanical protection and we specified in the 20, 2012 edition that the protection was HD conduit inside buildings but what we didn't say very well was where what was actually inside a building and we defined it much better in the 2014 edition where we said uh, it's within ceilings wall cavities and under floors so uh, that's a better definition than just inside buildings. It doesn't apply to the earth conductors, so you don't actually have to put the earth conductor, the equal potential bonding conductor for the array inside HD conduit, but you might as well. It's just one less bit of wire to kind of drag through the building. Um, there is a little exemption on the HD conduit requirements too, which is you can have up to 300 mils of um, DC cabling not inside conduit at the term terminals of the inverter as long as they are adequately mechanically protected and the system is below 600 volts. And that's really a, um, looking at from an ASNZS 3000 perspective, uh, is it installed a location where it won't be, those cables won't be damaged by location? And that, that's really to accommodate the fact that many inverters use uh, a plug and socket connection for the PV array and it's not practicable to conduit right up to the inverter's um, plug and socket um, connections, so we allow that 300 mils. And also to remove the inverter, you need to be able to unplug them, and it would be difficult if it had conduit over it. It's uh, not a requirement, by the way, HD conduit for non-domestic installations, where there is another means to minimise uh, risk, and so I'm just going to move myself up a bit there. Uh, so minimising risk can be, once again, by location, uh, think about the clauses in ASNZS 3000 about protection of cables and if you're putting them uh, out of harm's way, uh, out of reach, maybe in a commercial installation in cable tray um, close to the ceiling, it doesn't, the, the DC cables could go in there as well as long as you've got your 50 mils of separation between any other circuits of AC or telecommunication or data. Uh, they could go in that same cable tray and wouldn't have to be in... Um, HD conduit. So just pointing out that AS3000's mechanical protection applies to DC cables as well as AC cables. Restricted access. Yeah, so um, <laughs> I like this sign. People don't read signs, do they? Uh, maybe they do. I just thought this one really emphasised the fact that they mean do not touch. Um, yeah, so we introduced uh, a more clear definition of restricted access in the 2014 edition and we pointed out that for systems over 600 volts, restricted access has been required since 2012, but we didn't give a very good definition of restricted. So um, it can be restricted by a, a range of things, including, uh, what do we got here, a barrier such as a fence, a padlock gate or locked door, restricted by location, such as a roof, uh, uh, with no ready means of access, i.e. not a permanently fixed ladder. Over 600 volts, uh, all DC cables, including the protection and isolation devices, must be restricted, so access can only be by the use of a tool, and that includes the plug and sockets. 
So effectively it means uh, once you go over 600 volts on the DC side, and that's VOC max, that, uh, under the coldest conditions, you're going to have to uh, encase in, in, in conduit or duct um, or cable tray all of the DC cables right up to the terminals, the inverter. Now that actually includes a DC isolator if you happen to have one. Uh, so if there's not an integrated DC isolator in the inverter, the DC isolator itself is actually restricted access. You might think, hang on, that's a switch. Well, it's not really an emergency switch. It's there for maintenance and service so that you can turn off the, um, the DC from the array if you're working on the inverter. So it's there for authorised workers, so hence it's restricted. Um, we better defined adjacent. It said that you needed to have uh, isolation adjacent to an inverter within three millimetre, three metres, um, and fully visible from both locations. Now that would apply to the DC side of the inverter and also the AC side of the inverter. And the reason we put fully visible there is it can't be around a corner. The principle of having um, isolation at a piece of equipment is so that you can work on it and see that it's turned off. So that requirement to have fully visible would preclude things like the isolators around the corner or it's through a door, um, such as an inverter outside the house and the main switchboard or uh, is a flush mount board inside the house in the hallway. Um, that's not fully visible from both locations. We better define domestic uh, installations. Uh, we specified domestic dwelling was a, um, using the National Construction Code of Australia. I'm not quite sure what the equivalent in New Zealand is, but a class one, two, three, or ten building, uh, which is a, a single dwelling. Um, I'll just move myself out of the way. Uh, units, boarding house, or shed uh, are all considered domestic, um, whereas uh, the others uh, are exempted from that domestic definition. We removed one little anomaly, which was requiring anodized array frames in marine environments. Um, you just have to follow manufacturer's requirements. So if the, the modules or frame aren't suitable for uh, being close to the sea, then you can't use them. The labeling requirements, um, we increased the labeling requirements on the conduit to be every two meters, uh, and that would be um, visible. So once again, you might have been used to, certainly if you're did your electrical apprenticeship of hiding the labels by turning them towards the wall on your conduits. Now you actually need to display them. Now uh, companies like Marley in New Zealand actually print the, the DC warning labels onto their conduits so you can just make sure that's visible. Um, and in a roof space, uh, if they're not easily visible, you might want to tag them as well. The fire and emergency sign, um, move myself out of the way again, is uh, required to have two pieces of information, the short circuit current of the array and the maximum open circuit voltage. Now that isn't just look at the back of the panel, it says the panels are 45 volts and you multiply that by a number of panels, might be 10 of them, you go, oh, that's 450 volts. No, that would be wrong. In fact, if I see a nice round number written on that label, I'm, I guess they probably haven't calculated it because you need to calculate for the coldest operating temperatures. And there's a table in 5033 to give you multipliers for different minimum temperatures, uh, ranges, like five degree ranges. The short circuit current is that given on the back of the module. So um, if you've got one string, it's a short circuit cur current of one string. If you've got two strings in parallel, it's a short circuit current of two strings. It's basically to provide emergency services with information about the risk. Where DC conditioning units um, are used, we uh, can use the maximum voltage of the inverter as the VOC um, and the DC current is that of the inverter as well. So because the inverter controls DCUs, uh, we can use the inverter's um, input ratings as the maximum voltage. And here's an example of a data sheet for an inverter with um, and if it was connected to uh, DCUs, because this inverter can operate at up to 800 volts, even though its MPPT range is 350 to 600, we'd actually have to consider that this system is restricted access because the inverter is capable of operating the array above uh, 600 volts. And there's an example of the warning sign, that sometimes called the fire sign, uh, for a AC solar array, i.e. micro-inverters. And uh, 
it, the wording indicates that it, since it's an AC solar array and you've got to say where it is, uh, that you need to turn off the main switch for that inverter supply uh, and that it doesn't de-energize the PV system. Probably not a big deal given that with microinverters, the maximum voltage on the DC side is just one panel. There's the new shutdown procedure sign. Um, keep it simple. Uh, many kits will already come with this. We added that yellow section and the hazard sign uh, to the bottom there. And uh, uh, it points out that the p turning off the DC isolator at the PCE, at the inverter, doesn't de-energize the array or its cables. So that's, there's still um, live cables in the roof, for instance, or up on the roof, uh, but you've just isolated at the inverter uh, or maximum power point tracker. So that's, that's a little um, overview of 5033, but what I've got is a little additional piece on um, DC uh, isolators and their voltage rating. So let's just jump over to this. Now, the reason I've added this on uh, is a kind of a request from uh, one of you out there is to talk a bit about how to choose a DC isolator. Now, the, the thing that new, newcomers to this industry find surprising is that there isn't actually a standard voltage for um, switch gear. You might be used to, um, you know, going to a wholesaler and buying a 6KA circuit breaker for a resident for domestic application or a 10KA for a commercial, but you just know that the voltages are what they are. They're the grid voltages, so you don't actually have to specify a voltage rating for your switch gear or your cable protection equipment. But with uh, a DC array, you actually construct the voltage by putting panels together in series. So there isn't a standard voltage. Um, you know, small systems might be hundreds of volts and large systems might be way up in, you know, close to a thousand volts or more. And therefore the switch gear needs to be suitably rated. But it's not that simple either because it depends on the, t the um, topology of the inverter. Now, here's a data sheet from a DC isolator um, manufacturer. And remember, most of these manufacturers are global manufacturers. So they're not necessarily uh, making their data sheets for our particular standard. And therefore, they're just showing that, uh, in this case, the three-pole device has a 750-volt uh, rating, but they're showing that all of the switching is on the positive side. So uh, there's three poles in series on the positive side and a common negative. So we actually don't have a um, double-poled isolation on both the positive and the negative. And that's common for systems where the negative conductor might be grounded, for instance. Though it's very uncommon these days for grid connect systems to ground the negative conductor because of the topology of inverters. The picture on the right there is showing a four pole device and four poles can be wired in different combinations of series and parallel for different, out different uh, outcomes. So I'm going to run through the problem in a, just with a, a picture here. Now, this, this picture, I'm going to quickly um, draw this on my drawing pad over here. So let me just cut across to my drawing pad. There we go. All right. Um, so what we got here is, uh, where's my little sketch gone? There it is. So I've drawn a, a very simple representation of a single string array and um, this system is connected to a inverter like this. It's our inverter and the inverter converts to AC. So there's our AC output. Okay. And so we've got a, a positive side to the inverter and a negative side to the inverter. Now what used to happen, and I say used to because uh, inverters have really changed over time, is that they used to have a transformer inside them that galvanically isolated the AC side from the DC side. And therefore, any faults on the DC side had no impact. So if I draw a fault on here to Earth, that fault, there is no reference to Earth on the positive or negative conductor in this, in this diagram. And therefore, that fault actually does nothing. I mean, it doesn't actually create a fault current. It's just referencing one of the poles of the array to Earth. Um, it may 
significantly impact on the inverter's performance, or it may not. It's the system's floating. Um, it's unlikely to impact unless there's some earth fault detection system. But these days, we use inverters that have what's called um, uh, uh, they're, they're non-isolating. And therefore, and there's the symbol for an inverter, and before you shoot me, uh, you don't have to put the AC and the DC on the side that the connections go. Uh, it's just a convention of a drawing for a symbol. So it converts DC to AC, but inside there is no galvanic isolation. So you could think of the connections like this. When the inverter's operating, the DC is directly connected to the AC side. Um, it actually switches back and forth, you know, 100 times a second or so, uh, and that's how it generates uh, an AC waveform. But when it's operating, there is no galvanic isolation between the AC side and the DC side. So here's our um, earthing point here, and we've accidentally earthed over here. So while that system's operating, we're going to get a fault current that goes like this. So it, it goes right through the DC side, right through the inverter, usually destroying it, uh, back through the transformer, back through the neutral, through, <laughs> through the earth conductor, and that's a bit scary when you think there might be DC flowing through your switchboard, through your earth conductor, um, <laughs> uh, without you knowing about it. So removing the main earth could be a, a little bit hazardous. So the, the reason I've drawn this picture is to show that one of the poles of the DC isolator has no fault current flowing through it. So we actually have to consider, with transformless inverters, the voltage rating on each switched leg of the isolator. So if I've got uh, 550 volts here, open circuit maximum, I could have across here, as it switches, 550 volts on just one uh, switched leg of the uh, DC isolator. And by the way, I should draw them as ganged. They're ganged like this. So that means I need a per switched leg voltage rating for this product. If the product is sold with a rating for both poles uh, being operated, breaking the current across both switched legs, uh, then it's probably going to be approximately half, but don't assume that. Check in the data sheet. So that's one of the biggest mistakes um, people make is thinking that it says um, the product's rated for 1,000 volts on the, on the box, but in fact, it's only probably about half of that on each switched leg. And also, the thing about DC isolators is their voltage ratings depend on their current. So as the current um, goes down, their voltage rating goes up. So it might be 1,000 volt rated uh, at 16 amps, but it's only 800 volt rated at uh, 20 amps, and you know at 32 amps, it drops down to 600 volts, etc. So you've got to get those tables from the manufacturer. The, uh, a lot of the, the specialist wholesalers will or already provide you with this, this data, so that's a good thing to, to plug away your wholesaler with, saying, oh, can I please get the data sheet for this one? Um, it might be in the box. It might not actually be uh, appropriate for New Zealand or Australia, so you really need to check some of those things. Okay, so that's um, just explaining a transformerless, and so I'll go um, uh, non-isolating, so non-isolating trans inverter which by the way is almost every inverter on the market now uh, it, you might think that we always go to safer solutions but actually uh, we rely more and more on electronics to protect ourselves with uh, non-isolating inverters uh, transformers inverters were inherently a little bit safer but they're less efficient more expensive they were heavier and so uh, weren't so popular so that's a, a, let me just jump back here. Here we go. So that's a little overview of some of the things to consider uh, when you are installing a PV array. Uh, I took you up to the DC terminals of the inverter or the power conditioning equipment to be use the terminology in the standard. Uh, what I'd like to do is go beyond the inverter next week uh, and cover off on the AC side of the standard, which is 4777. Part one is the installation standard. And uh, it's a joint standard with Australia and New Zealand, so uh, it's equally applicable to both countries. Now this week, I've been running these daily live streams at three o'clock Australian uh, Eastern Standard Time and 5 p.m. New Zealand Standard Time. Uh, next week, 
I've got my kids back here. Uh, I share them with my ex, and so I'm going to have kids at home that I've got to homeschool. So I'll probably only do uh, two or three next week. So just watch the the usual uh, social media channels for announcements of my next live streams. And I'd love to get some comments about what you want to learn more about. So you know, uh, in the what do they always say in the comments below, um, put some requests about what you'd like to see more of. And uh, I guess I better say you should really try and subscribe. That helps me um, build my my, um, my channel and uh, and click that bell icon if you want to know whenever I've posted a, a new video, particularly if like today I bug it up and manage to stop it midstream and have to start it again. Okay, well, thanks to everyone uh, for turning up today and uh, hope to see you next week. Okay, see ya. <laughs>